Welcome to the 2022 Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment Session, Improving HIV Health Outcomes Through Coordinated Care, Housing, and Employment Services. My name is Kimberly Milner, and I am an Administrative Associate within HRSA's HIV and AIDS Bureau's Office of the Associate Administrator, and I will be serving as your moderator today. We thank you for joining today's session. As you participate in the session, please feel free to add your questions or comments in the chat box. At the conclusion of the session, the presenters will have the opportunity to address your questions. Let's begin. Good morning. Welcome to our session, Improving HIV Health Outcomes Through Coordinated HIV Care, Housing and Employment Services. I'm Serena Rajavian. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and I served as co-principal investigator for this spin, HRSA SPINS initiative. And I'm pleased to be here with my colleagues today to share um, our interventions, some of the outcomes and lessons learned from this initiative. I have no relevant financial interest to disclose. So in the next hour or so, um, here are the objectives for this session. We're gonna describe how unmet social needs of people with HIV, such as housing and employment specifically, affect their HIV adherence, engagement, and viral suppression. We're gonna summarize some of the multi-sectoral care models that are implemented by the 12 Ryan White funded demonstration sites to coordinate HIV care, housing and employment services to improve HIV health outcomes. And two of my colleagues are here to talk specifically about the models that they use to help their, um, their clients and patients at their settings. And then we're gonna examine the impact that gaining housing and employment has ha had on client HIV health outcomes and some implications and lessons learned. So a little bit about this initiative. Um, this was um, funded through Part F, Special Projects of National Significance Program. Um, the, the initiative started in 2017 and um, ended in 2020, right when um, we were, we were right at the end of our project when we were hit with the corona pandemic. So that's gonna have some implications for um, our findings. And we can talk about that during our discussion as well. Um, and the main goal of this initiative was to develop and implement innovative interventions that would coordinate not just HIV care and treatment for people with HIV, but housing and employment services as well. Because we hypothesized that um, if you house and ha help people with income generating activities, that will help improve their HIV health outcomes. Um, and we were particularly focused on low income, uninsured and underserved people with HIV um, from racial ethnic minority communities. So um, this is a map of where the um, sites and partners for this initiative were located. Um, there were 12 um, demonstration sites that actually implemented the interventions. Um, today, we're gonna hear from our partners at um, P Positive Impact Health Center in Georgia, Atlanta area, and from um, Liberty Community Services in the New Haven, serving the New Haven, Connecticut area. But across the 12 sites, there were four city, county, and health departments that were funded, four community health centers, and then four um, aid service organizations or um, comprehensive care agencies. And then um, there was one evaluation technical assistance center provided housed at Boston University. And the interventions that were implemented by this initiative, all the sites um, had care coordinators or patient navigators. So the idea of the program was really to work at a multi-sectoral level, um, bringing together housing, employment, and healthcare providers to improve outcomes for people with HIV. Three of the sites had system-wide case management training three worked on system level trainings, uh, system level um, initiatives to streamline the referral process across these sectors. Two actually implemented um, I, uh, programs to strengthen their data integration and IT capacity so they could better um, track and measure housing and employment outcomes, which is traditionally not always done by um, Ryan White providers. 
Um, and then in terms of partnerships, eight um, formally had partnerships with um, a HUD or HAPWA agency. And, it, uh, and then three also partnered with the Department of Labor Agency in their area to improve employment programs. The eligible uh, eligibility criteria for our initiative, uh, all participants were 18 years or older. Um, they were living with HIV and had to have one of the following criteria. They were newly diagnosed within the past 12 months. They were not engaged in HIV primary care uh, um, for at least six months. They were at risk of falling out of care, um, maybe dealing with a substance, uh, substance use disorder, and they, or they were not virally suppressed. And then they had to be homeless or unstably housed at the time of enrollment or unemployed or underemployed. So that, um, that's a little bit overall of the initiative. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Eric Moore at Positive Impact Health Centers to talk about their intervention and some of their findings. Eric? Hey, everyone. Um, I am Eric Moore from Positive Impact Health Centers. We are located in um, Decatur, Georgia, <clears throat> which is just outside of Atlanta. Um, we are a clinic and we have a multitude of services. We pretty much serve clients on every level from um, healthcare to mental health, substance abuse, case management. Um, we kind of consider ourselves a one-stop shop for those kind of things. So I thought we were a good fit for this housing and employment program. Uh, next slide, Serena. And I have no financial interest to disclose in this uh, production. So this is a poster that we put together um, at the end of our project. Like Serena said, unfortunately, we got hit with COVID right at the end of the program. Um, so, you know, some of our numbers reflect that, but um, this is something we put together. And I think one of the key highlights down here in the right hand corner, the bottom right hand corner there, it's kind of the before and after picture. So before we started the program, folks coming into the program, um, none of them were housed or they're either unstably housed or unhoused. By the end of it, um, we had 80% of the, the uh, participants had some type of housing, whether that was, um, you know, housing on their own, um, you know, something that they were paying for, or, you know, renting an, a house with a friend, having a roommate, moving back in with family but at least they were um, no longer unstably housed or homeless. Um, the viral suppression point, uh, we started off with 53% being virally suppressed. So from that, you can kind of um, take away that, you know, this is definitely like a, a group that we're working with that had um, a larger need than maybe your average client. I think our agency's um, viral suppression rate is 90, 91, 92% on average. So folks that were in our program coming in at 53%, obviously there were some challenges there. Um, we did get it up to 71%, which I think, you know, kind of correlates along with that housing point. Um, like Serena said, you know, the idea is that once you get people housed, they're way more likely to engage in healthcare. Um, you know, so those two numbers, 80, 80 and 71, I know it's not super close, but that's close enough to say, you know, that that's, you know, a significant factor. If you get folks housed, they're going to then end up, um, coming to the doctor and hopefully being virally suppressed. And then the bottom part there with income, 50% came in with either no income or limited income. And by the end of it, we had about 85% of our folks with at least some type of income. And that included um, you know, social security benefits or retirement, um, you know, whether it was working off the books, it was kind of all income combined together, but 85% of folks kind of left the program with some type of income. And next slide. So this is our process. Um, I know it's kind of a lot on one slide, but um, you know, basically we're looking at um, what does it take to have successful health, health outcomes? And again, our, our idea is that it's housing and employment. Um, so the kind of the path people take, you know, they were referred into our program. They started working with the case manager. Uh, the case man, each case manager had about 50 people on their caseload, but Realistically, they were probably working with maybe 30 to 35 people at any given time, depending on, you know, people coming in and out of the program. So that means that they could, that they could dedicate a large amount of time to working with each, with each client. Again, the idea is to get them um, successfully housed or stably housed. 
And then once they do that, <clears throat> moving on to engaging in other clinic services, mental health, substance abuse, making sure they come to see the doctor, taking meds, that kind of stuff. And then just at the end, uh, maintaining that process and working with the case manager on an ongoing basis to uh, kind of fill in the gaps as needed. And next slide. <clears throat> so leveraging um, available housing resources, I think is the key to our, um, or our housing part of our program because we were able to use um, internal HOPWA funding, um, external agencies that had HOPWA funding and um, housing um, assistance, but then also using our own programs to kind of um, subsidize and like, like I said, fill in the gaps where maybe HOPWA couldn't take care of things. Next slide. <clears throat> so this was a little case study we put together. This individual, he had come in, um, I remember him, he was actually assigned to me years and years ago when I first started uh, doing case management before we had this program and I could never hunt this guy down. I called him, you know, multiple times, really tried to get in touch with him. Then all of a sudden one day he popped up, he, was, he came in for substance abuse services. Um, someone from our program, the substance abuse program came over and talked to me and said, hey, you know, this individual's here. I'm like, I got to meet this guy. I got to find out, you know, why, why have I not been able to hunt you down for all these years? So he gave me a story and, you know, like I say, a lot of times he, you know, he had one from each category. He had substance abuse issues. He had mental health issues. He had adherence issues. He had um, medical issues outside of HIV. He had housing issues. Um, so we really wanted to get him into our program. And, you know, as you read through this, when he came in, he was actually living in his drug dealer's garage. So, you know, that was going to make it really hard for him to ever break away from the substance use part of it. So the, again, the housing stability part of it was going to be big with working with him. Next slide. So what we did was we worked with him through our HOPWA program. We got him out of his drug dealer's house and got him into um, gap lodging for about eight weeks. So while he was in there, we kind of, we were able to get him stabilized with some of his medical issues. We got him um, signed up. He had to have a couple surgeries done. Um, when he got out of surgery, he then did four weeks in recuperative care. And while he was in recuperative care, we put together a plan to, to move him into um, another um, short-term kind of hotel stay until we could find a permanent housing. And since he was, I think he was 63 years old, um, he was eligible for senior housing, which made it a little bit easier because that stuff, um, there, there tend to, tends to be more openings coming through with that. Um, and plus it's subsidized, so you know, that, that would be a good thing with him at his income level. Next slide. Yeah, so as I said earlier, you know, the, the housing stability is a huge part of it. Once he got into housing um, and was uh, stabilized with that, then he was way more likely to come back for medical services. He continued to come to substance abuse treatment. He um, engaged with the behavioral health coordinator. So really, again, the housing stability was a huge part of that kind of the, the link to um, getting everything else straightened out. Next slide. So here is his, his personal outcomes. Um, he ended up in permanent um, subsidized senior housing, which is amazing. He actually lives right down the street from me. I see him and when I'm driving to work, I probably see him two or three times a week. So I know he's doing okay. Um, it's a really nice neighborhood, very safe, great for someone uh, his age. He's definitely decreased his substance use. I know he still uses a little bit, but it's not the issue that it once was. Um, he's definitely engaged in behavior health. He's engaged in um, HIV, his HIV care. He's undetectable. Got a, he's got a lot of his uh, non-HIV health-related issues worked out. He's got uh, some financial stability. He does have a pension uh, along with his retirement, so he's doing okay with that. And he's in one of the best neighborhoods for in Atlanta for reliable public transportation. So. Um, you know, things are definitely looking up for him. Like I said, I see him quite frequently, so I know he's doing well. Next slide. So this is a little bit about how we kind of leverage the HAPA side of things, and then are also the internal um, gap lodging side of things with our agency. Um, it's all just about, you know, being able to get somebody stabilized long enough to get them out of plan. And a lot of times HAPA, doesn't provide um, a long enough stay in a hotel or in temporary housing for them to ever get off the ground. So, you know, we did do, like I said, about eight weeks 
in the Hopper program, and that allowed us to get him in recuperative care after recuperative care into our program, and then on to stable housing. So um, it would really benefit um, any agency to look at funding something like a gap lodging, hotel stay, something like that outside of Hopla, because you really do need that time to get um, high acuity clients stabilized. Next slide. So in our program, um, in our SPINS program, one out of four people did access um, the gap lodging or the temporary hotel stays. Um, so I guess we were calling it the THP, uh, temporary housing, um, temporary hotel placement. Um, yeah, we had 62% um, were able to transition out of the hotel into stable housing, which is a great number. I think that um, that the HOPO program might be a little bit less than that in our agency because it just doesn't provide enough time for folks to actually um, get stabilized and then move on to housing. Next slide. And the average stay was 16 weeks. So if you do the math, that's about four months. Um, it seems like a long time, but when you're talking about um, getting people into stable housing, you know, that really isn't that long because they, they need to build up, um, you know, money to be able to afford the first month rent or to secure, you know, funding for that, secure a security deposit. So um, the 16 weeks is really, you know, a vital part of them, you know, being able to kind of stabilize and then move on. Next slide. So I think I've probably run through a lot of these here already. The uh, you know the benefits of it, just you know, providing um, stability and safety. <clears throat> Excuse me. But then the challenges are, uh, you know, depending on what time of year um, and what city you're in, you know, whether or not there's enough availability for that kind of housing resource. Um, we did a lot of the legwork before we started this program. We went out to um, a certain hotel chain and worked something out with them where we knew we could refer people and it would be a quick process. You know, we wouldn't have to wait for days or we wouldn't have to come with a credit card to pay. They would just invoice us and bill us. So if folks want to contact me afterwards, I can um, get you the name of that hotel chain. They have uh, locations throughout the country. Um, so you can set things up with like an automatic uh, payment. So it just makes it easier for you to um, secure the housing or secure the hotel rooms. And then in the future, I would just, uh, I would say the, the collaboration between all the different parts of your agency, whether it's uh, substance abuse, uh, mental health, case management, clinic, like just making sure everyone's on the same page when you're working with clients like this is such a critical factor because every piece kind of has to fall in place for them to, to move on to the next level of being stably housed. Next slide. So for this individual, like I said, I, I think he, he really took advantage of the stability that finally getting into housing afforded him. Um, we were able to do a furniture bank referral. So they furnished this whole house for them. Um, you know, we've got them set up with, you know, budgeting, have them set up every year with lie heat payments for his uh, heating um, during the winter. We have them connected with uh, food banks and food services. In, uh, in Atlanta, there's a half fare card for folks that are either elderly or um, disabled. You can get a half, half price uh, public transportation. Um, we do have him enrolled in ACA, so he's got his own health care plan now. So, um, you know, things have really worked out well for him. And I, I think that's part of the intensive case management that goes along with it. You can, you know, you can get to this level, but it takes time. It takes a big effort and it takes um, a real kind of dedication. You know, it's, it's tough if somebody has 50 people like this on their caseload, because that can be overwhelming. But when you only have maybe 30 people you're working with, this is a lot more um, a lot more attainable, I would say. Next slide. That might be it for me. Yeah, that's it. So if you have questions, uh, please let me know. And I can also direct you to our uh, manual that we wrote about the uh, program, kind of outlines like step by step what you need to do to set up the same kind of program. It's online. Um, you can take a look at it. You can take bits and pieces from it. You can take only the housing part, only the employment part. You can take the case management part. Um, but I'd be more than willing to direct you to that. And like I said, I'd be more than willing to direct folks towards, um, you know, possibilities for gap lodging or temporary stay hotels and uh, that, you know, we kind of have relationships with that I could pass you on to and uh, see if you can get connected with them. I think that's it for me.
I hand it off to Sylvia. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm Sylvia Mascarello. I'm the program director at Liberty Community Services. And we were um, the subcontract with Yale University for this um, study. And it was part of a, the Yale University's um, AIDS program provided the healthcare aspect and Liberty Community Services provided the employment and the, um, and the housing intervention. Next slide, please. I think I have no financial uh, interest to disclose. Next slide. Um, what did we identify at the beginning? We were looking, obviously, the population we serve is consistent with what Serena um, described, because in the study, you have to comply with the expectations of the funder. Um, but the gap that we've been encountering, and I think most HIV providers have, is that employment traditionally was not the focus of service planning for people living with HIV. And, you know, it's really interesting to have been alive through the whole and being a professional person through the whole HIV um, history um, to be able to have seen that at the beginning there was the hopelessness and helplessness, fear and unknown then to some treatment which would prolong people's lives, but they were, services really were medical in nature focused on that. And then, um, and then moving towards uh, a system where people were um, able to live pretty full lives with HIV as a chronic disease. And so employment, um, those of us who are in the employment field know that there's a culture that happens in a sector where um, employment was not seen as a primary focus for, for planning for people. And that has happened with mental health, developmental disabilities. You name the population, it's been there. There was a thought, you have a disability, you don't work. And I've lived long enough to know that was real. Um, and so the need, uh, so that was true also of HIV and HIV's history was so much closer that um, I think breaking that down is a little bit easier. But the need also, so the gap was no employment services really around as the culture. And uh, the need is, um, we see resistance, fear, and misconceptions um, that need to be um, overcome in order for people to make progress towards employment. And next slide, please. Um, what our hope is, if people do um, implement an employment, um, an employment intervention at your organizations that you will see that um, employment goals will be uh, integrated in all the treatment plans and that all the various providers, housing, uh, medical, and uh, in case management will be talking about employment as a culture. And that um, providers will have a strategy to help people maneuver through their fear and resistance. And they'll identify partners in the community so that they can, you know, maximize use of what's out there or create what they need. And that um, providers will have a working knowledge of benefits versus um, wages or how they work together. Next slide, please. This is um, the process of creating a program. And what we are talking about is kind of the vocationalization process, an organization that has not had a focus on employment to having a focus on employment. And the important piece is to have a champion who says employment, 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 and everybody can work if they want to, and if they, you know, that they can. Your disability doesn't say you can't. It's your functions and how that impacts your abilities that you look at and how can you work around. Um, and then uh, it's super important to know what's in your community first. Don't don't duplicate what's out there. Use what's out there. Plan and implement and constantly have this review and revise with consumer input. And next slide, please. Um, how does power, which is talking about employment spectrum, differ from an employment, a traditional employment program? Um, a traditional employment program you are referred there because you said, I want to work. Okay, that is your goal for going there. I want to work. You identify an employment goal, you 
uh, do your history, you do a resume, an employment plan, you get employment, et cetera. It does not have a trauma-informed approach. It does not necessarily integrate with, with as a design with housing and with, um, with uh, medical. So those are pieces that happen. And then a person moves along after they've gotten the job, our job is done, outcome achieved. And um, that's not how the employment spectrum works. We looked at employment spectrum as saying, I can make progress in my life. I want to be around other people. I'm isolated, I am frightened. And um, we say, do you want to do something different in your life? And at the beginning, we talk about your strengths. It actually begins at the referral stage, which I'll talk about in a, in a, a slide coming up. Um, we focus on personal growth. We're trauma-informed. And people learn. They learn about benefits. They learn about um, what they can do. We celebrate progress, and we really work towards creating cohesive um, group. It sounds like we're not doing employment but believe me, we're getting there a whole different way. And I've done employment programs for 40 years. This is not the way we approach traditional. This is something different. And this just kind of has changed our outcomes enormously. Next slide, please. Um, a lot of times what we've heard from people, there's a lot of resistance and fear versus, you know, you know a can-do attitude. Uh, oftentimes I say, I just applied for disability benefits or I have disability. I'm scared. I can't do it. I failed before, all those things. And instead, let's just flip that and say, I applied for disability and what can I do? And uh, very important to know when persons in the application process for disability benefits, they really should not be looking for a job right then. However, they can volunteer improve their skills, take a class. They can have what we call an informal cash agreement with someone. I do this, he give me some cash. Some people have called that under the table. We stay away from that, it's a little more stigmatizing, but it is value. It says you're worth something, what you do has value. And so then the employment spectrum looks at and we try to overcome barriers to work, advantages of work and how we can make work work and we take progressive steps. Next slide, please. Um, you can enter anywhere on the employment spectrum. You could walk in and say, I want a job. That's why you were referred. Okay, You're gonna, we're gonna work on that with you. Um, you can say, I just wanna have something to do. All right, I wanna learn. I heard you have some re-entry people in this program because we address the needs of the folks there. Um, but we offer power, pursuing opportunities with, uh, with employment res and resources, we offer that to every person at our intake and at the six month period, everybody who's in our services. And um, I can't um, under, uh, under stress how COVID had a huge impact on our progress here, but we are back up and running in person. And so this is a very exciting time for us. Um, it's an individualized path, multiple starting and ending points, and we really pull local resources together, our partners, over um, the period of the uh, cycle to connect people and create a network of named people with whom they have a relationship that they can get more help with. So we will have someone from the community college present on what that is. That way, when a person is ready and they say, I want to go to school, they have someone to start with. We have people from the banks telling you how to manage your money. We have um, financial empowerment folks, uh, volunteer folks. Next slide, and I'll probably get deeper into this at this. Basically, what we started with is this old time model called a job club. I mean, it is old school. This came out, I think, really when veterans were coming back from one of the world wars, where people came together to support one another in getting jobs. Um, but there's something valuable about that. There is the not being alone, sharing leads. A person gets a job in the group and says, hey, they're hiring. 
people can test their their skills with each other and learn together. So it is really a um, it's, it's, so it's twofold. It's creating the network of support and a structure so people can can get together with that focus on moving forward. Next slide, please. Building on strengths from the first minute. Case manager refers somebody to the program. This is vital. In addition to the usual things you put on a referral form, they have to say one authentic observed strength about that person. And sometimes, and I don't know if you have experienced this, but I have, at first blush, I don't often see strengths. I see all the things we have to fix or help them fix, but we've got to start putting on that lens of strengths on ourselves that forces us to behave differently. And it, it validates something you've really seen. And it might be that the person asks for help when they need it. Okay, good. It's good self-advocate. How can we mine some other strengths from that? So it's um, we start there. Next slide, please. It's an eight-week cycle. And that receiving power um, lead has read all of this. They have read all the strengths and they have committed them to their memory because they are going to reinforce what they see over the eight weeks. And they're going to be able to, when you're giving an authentic feedback that's positive, that has way more value than some throwaway attaboy. You know, attaboys are great or at a woman or at a person, but um, they're great. But authentic recognition of something that you do is vital and it really will help people move forward. So it's an eight week cycle. We have two groups a week and it's all the same folks. They have been oriented, they can sign, they can sign up for it. And then we start with not what's your employment history. Move that away. That's not what we're asking. What we are asking is, what are your strengths? What have you done? Where have you lived? Who are you in contact with? All sorts of things. What do you like? And every week has a theme, but what we did for the uh, demonstration project, and we continue to do it, is we administer um, uh, self-evaluation scales, um, self-efficacy, self-esteem, and self-care at the beginning, at the end, and then uh, we are setting it up as post post cycle. COVID came in, kind of messed up our timeline, but we did do um, beginning, mid cycle, and post. But we want to do a post post, and then um, throughout the um, the program, we take a formal time to get input from the people in the program, um, and that might adjust what we do in the future of the cycle or the next cycle. For instance, the input from the people we serve changed how we do our schedule. It had us include other community resources like um, New Haven Legal Assistance or some more reentry programs and uh, more information on expungement because that was one thing people brought up. They had justice involvement. This was a barrier to them. And um, so we uh, take their input and we adjust as we move forward. And then we have community partners, the most important part. You can't have the same talking head. You have to have different faces, different people, different personalities with access to different resources. It's all about connecting people to other people and becoming seen as a person that wants to change their life or move your life forward. And like I said, our community partners include private nonprofit providers who might have volunteer opportunities their employers, banks, financial empowerment, educational programs, training programs, you name it, they come in. And health folks, because we do pay attention to self-care and put some um, specific modules in there about self-care and health. Next slide. This is kind of what a cycle looks like. This is an actual cycle. Um, we talk about, we start the foundation on strengths and then showing you what resources we have. And we set up emails that you would use in a professional way. It's not so you can get a job, but it's so you don't have your um, 
Jenny XXX6969 is your email address. That's not going to get you anywhere. It's we set it up with a remember with a uh, memorable password set you up so you have a Google uh, account. You can scan up all your important documents, have access to your email everywhere. It's a it's great for folks. The next week we do write a resume, which is really a strengths assessment and a cover letter. So this is who I am. And um, then folks are able to use the computer lab and do all sorts of things. Next slide, please. This will show you some of the themes. We did entrepreneurship and banking, volunteering, disability and health, education, personal development. At the end, we're going into employment and looking at really doing employment and then um, we do a presentation of first impressions where people get a little makeover and uh, we've been really successful at getting either almost no cost or no cost um, aestheticians helping us out with folks. And then again, we do our, um, our uh, self-evaluation and uh, scales. Um, when it was over the first time, as many times as I in my career have wanted to set up a, a peer-led group, I could never make it happen if I tried to do it. These guys came back and said, it's over? Can we keep meeting? Sure, the space is available, but who's going to do it? We'll open the door. What do you want to do? It's yours. And they set up a graduate group. They just wanted to be involved and they wanted to come back and talk to the next groups. We could never have designed that. That was a happy accident. Next slide, please. Um, very important, particularly with people who are living with disability benefits, who say, oh, no, I'm on benefits. I can't work. Well, you can. You will always get more money. And um, boy, that's a really stupid link at the bottom, but I can make a cleaner link. I can give you a cleaner link to this, which is an interactive, um, this is an interactive benefits calculator. The only numbers anyone has to change to see how earning money will impact a monthly benefits check, social SSI um, check, is the two that have the blue arrows on them. So, this example here is a person earning $600 a month, okay, if they work, which is a part-time job. It's a very part-time job. In Connecticut, uh, minimum wage, I think, I think it's either hovering at or is really close to $15 an hour or getting there by next January. So um, we look at it possibly at minimum wage for folks who are not looking to have a career yet but want to work and have a little more um, choice in their life. Um, so if a person um, receives a check right now, they get $841 a month. That's what they get. So that's it. They pay 30% of that towards rent if they are in subsidized housing. And that leaves them about 500 bucks um, or $588 to be exact to do everything with. That's limited choices. Our folks have trouble getting soap um you know paying their cell phones all that so um what we do is um look at them show them that yes your check will go down but you will have more money so if a person worked a part-time job we can plug that number in and say this is what's going to be different um so if a person did work minimal hours that would be like maybe 10 hours a week um they would have about $240 more a month. And I have to say with uh, right now, buses are free in Connecticut until December 30th. No fares for anyone um, just until then. Um, $240 a month is a lot more choices than you have right now. That's a new pair of, you know, that's if you need shoes, you're not scrounging. Um, next slide, please. So um, consumer involvement, I've talked about a lot. Input from the people we serve. Consumer driven, we don't do anything without talking to them first. They are part of it. And the graduate groups, this is you know crucial. Thank you, we were ready for the next slide, thank you. And um, we have promising outcomes. Um, we, the focus here is improving health outcomes through housing and employment. 
Um, so 71% of our enrollees progressed on the, on the employment spectrum. That means they did something else, not just came to the group, but they came to the group and did something, made a choice. 60% of them got paid employment. Uh, that is in comparison to our almost zero prior to for any participants that didn't go to power. I mean, we couldn't even discuss our outcomes. Um, but then, um, uh, and that's who um, entered um, school or training or volunteering. But anyway, at the end of the day, where you want to focus is the self-care scores. They all increased in that area, and it's significant. And if we, these were, we, our, um, our principal and investigator looked at these, and we are looking to move forward to make this an evidence-based practice and work more on, um, on our design. But the self-care, the self-care scores increased. Self-efficacy and self-esteem did not change significantly at all, which was surprising, except when you really look at it, people experiencing homelessness are pretty uh, capable of solving big problems pretty quick. So self-efficacy might not change. Um, anyway, next slide. Uh, we're happy to share, call us for that. It has increased our, in our um, ability to have ongoing employment services. At the beginning, we had no employees that were focused on employment. Now we have one person focused on SOAR, which is benefits, uh, helping people apply for disability, people who are experiencing homelessness. And we have um, two income and employment navigators. One focuses on power and, and job placement and the other one on um, the same things, but within a closed group of people. Next slide. Please feel free to contact me for anything. I'll send you the intervention manual, tells you how to, and this, the calculator and anything else in a live with live links in it. Thank you so much for your time. Next person, I'm handing you over to Tom. All right, great. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, thanks, everybody. My name is Tom Byrne. I'm an associate professor at the Boston University School of Social Work. Um, and I'm going to be presenting um, the results of the um, multi-site evaluation um, as, as part of this initiative. Boston University was funded also to evaluate um, the outcomes of folks who were enrolled in the intervention across all 12 of the demonstration sites. So I'm here uh, presenting this work, but I just also wanna acknowledge um, the full team of folks who were involved in the multi-site evaluation, and all of whose names are listed here on this slide, um, and uh, which included um, my colleague Serena, who you heard from earlier. And also uh, the folks not listed here are staff at each of the 12 demonstration sites who were tasked with um, you know, doing the on the ground data collection that um, resulted in the findings that you're gonna see me present here. So I just wanna acknowledge um, that I'm presenting this work, but it's really the result of hard work by a lot of a bigger, much larger group of people. So we can go to the next slide, Serena. Okay, and I have no relevant financial interest to disclose. Um, so the evaluation set out to address three uh, specific questions, which are listed here. Um, and all of these are um, really helping us try and better understand um, how folks' housing, employment, and health outcomes changed over time during uh, the period in which they were involved in the in receiving services from the intervention at their local site. So these are the three questions. So are there differences in health outcomes over time for people living with HIV? And importantly, did those health outcomes change as a function of folks' housing and employment status? And then we wanted to better understand factors associated with both improvements in employment and housing over time. So those were the three uh, key questions that the evaluation sought to address. So we can go to the next slide. So just really quickly to give you um, a little bit of background just on the characteristics of people who were enrolled in the intervention 
um, and then ultimately the evaluation. So across all 12 sites, there was a total of 1,261 folks involved in the intervention. Um, it, uh, participation in the multi-site evaluation specifically, which you know, essentially entailed people participating in multiple interviews at the time of their enroll enrollment and then at several follow-up time periods was totally voluntary. Um, so of those 1,261 folks, um, almost 1,100, so 1,082 actually enrolled in the multi-site evaluation. So what we're going to be presenting on is just information about those uh, 1,082 people who uh, agreed to participate in the multi-site evaluation. Um, and this is just a little bit, um, the, this slide is going to show us just a little bit of information about the char characteristics of these folks at the time that they enrolled in the evaluation. So this is just showing their housing status at enrollment. Um, so if you recall, Serena kind of mentioned earlier the um, eligibility criteria for this initiative essentially required people to be having housing problems, employment problems, and um, uh, health problems related to their, their HIV care. Um, and so what you see here is um, essentially people's housing arrangements at enrollment. And the, the color code is a little bit off, but you know, about 43% of folks were literally homeless. Uh, sorry, 44% were literally homeless, 43% were unstably housed, 11% um, were at imminent risk, um, and uh, a very small fraction, about 2%, um, were housed but had, uh, were still at risk of losing their housing. So folks, you know, highly, highly unstable, um, highly unstably housed um, group of folks enrolled in the intervention. Uh, in the evaluation. Um, the the, the um, participants were predominantly male, um, about 78% of them, 17% uh, were female, and about 5% uh, were transgender, uh, had another gender identity. And this is just showing you the age distribution of folks, sort of the nearly two thirds of participants were between the ages of 31 and 54, uh, about a quarter were 30 or younger and 13% were older than 55. Um, and um, this is just showing sort of the racial and ethnic distribution, um, a little more than 40% were African American, about a third were Hispanic or Latinx. Um, and the majority of folks were born in the United States. Almost one in five were born uh, in a different country. And this is just showing you um, the uh, education um, status of folks enrolled in the um, in multi-site uh, evaluation, which is obviously something that is um, potentially important when we're thinking about employment outcomes. And um, nearly 40%, uh, the thing that I'll kind of call out here is that nearly 40% of folks um, had some college and an additional 10% had a bachelor's degree or higher. So we're talking about nearly half of people enrolled um, had some uh, post-secondary education under their belts. Um, and this is just showing some um, other information about folks. So more, about two thirds, 67 percent of people involved in the uh, multi-site evaluation um, had some history of incarceration in state prison or in, in jail. Um, 70 percent met the criteria for depression, about half met the criteria for anxiety, 40 percent had history of trauma, and then rates of um, substance use um, and alcohol use were, were fairly high. Um, across all 12 sites and more than two thirds um, were food insecure in the past 30 days. So this is a, uh, the folks involved in this intervention had, in addition to um, their housing, employment and health related needs had a number of other um, overlapping and complex health and, and social challenges as this table shows. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so what we did is, um, you know, there was, uh, this is a, uh, the idea was to interview folks at the time of their enrollment and then every six months thereafter, um, 
you know, one of the challenges, not just for this intervention um, and this evaluation in particular, but when we're dealing um, with trying to um, do research or evaluation that um, follows up with a highly unstably housed group over time, it can be very difficult to locate people to do follow-up interviews. So we did have uh, a fair amount of um, attrition where it was difficult or not possible to do follow-up interviews with people who enrolled in the, um, in the evaluation. So what you're gonna see on the next couple slides is just findings from the subset of about 472 people for whom we had um, follow-up data um, uh, at 12 months following their enrollment. So the good, good news story here is that nearly 90% of people gained or maintained viral suppression at 12 months following their enrollment um, in, the, in the intervention. So that's a, you know, sort of a, a positive change. Um, and here we see um, you know, how folks' uh, housing status changed over time. Uh, and more than half either obtained or were, or were able to stay in permanent housing. Um, an additional quarter um, was able to get in some form of temporary housing. So you're talking about three quarters of folks who um, improved their housing situation uh, over time. And here we see uh, changes in employment. So about half of the sample was uh, employed either part-time or full-time uh, at 12 months following their um, enrollment in the intervention. Um, and so here, uh, what we did is we also looked at changes in uh, self-reported barriers to employment. So kind of the lighter blue uh, is the proportion of participants who reported a particular barrier at to employment at baseline and the darker blue is the proportion who reported that same barrier still existing at 12 months following their uh, enrollment. And you can see there was some, um, uh, across the board there were decreases in the proportion of people who reported, you know, essentially every type of barrier. Uh, what you see a few of these were uh, large enough that they reached the threshold for statistical significance, meaning that in statistical terms, the change was uh, different from zero. So there was sort of a statistically meaningful change in the proportion of people who reported feeling healthy enough to return to work, who reported being concerned with daily changes in health as a potential barrier to employment, um, and with the people who reported that, you know, the uh, ability to take time away from work to see their doctor was something that kept them from uh, seeking or being employed, and then also people uh, saying that they, um, you know, felt that their health would improve if, if they would, were employed. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is basically showing, um, and this is a way to kind of address that question of looking at the relationship between uh, changes in in housing status and changes in health over time. Um, so um, we didn't see actually any statistically significant relationship at 12 months between people's housing status and um, their um, and their um, and 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 their and whether they were virally suppressed. Um, we did sort of see. You can see in the far right pair of uh, columns there, the permanently housed group, you know, folks who were uh, permanently housed had, um, you know, more than half were virally suppressed, but we actually didn't see a significant relationship between housing status and, and viral suppression. Um, and sort of the same thing for employment here. Uh, here you kind of see, um, rates of viral suppression by employment status at six months. And there's some differences uh, in the rates of viral suppression based on people's status, but it wasn't statistically significant. Um, we did look at other things um, that were potentially associated with improvements in housing and employment status. And I'll just sort of 
share some of the key findings from those analysis here. You know, first we found that um, more sort of more social support and no recent history of incarceration were associated with improvements in housing and employment. Um, so, you know, that could be an indicator, those two things, people could be locating employment and housing through stronger social networks and people with no recent history of incarceration may face less barriers and less stigma in accessing housing and employment is one way to interpret uh, those relationship. Um, and we also found that a, a history of previous employment and um, sort of people accessing um, needed care for mental health um, were both associated with uh, Im improved employment. So, so those are some of the, the things that we found to be associated with housing and employment. Uh, the other thing that we did is we tracked kind of the actual intervention activities uh, that were being provided to intervention participants by um, all of the sites. So the sites provided this information, they collected it. Um, and over time, there were nearly 12,000 encounter forms that were logged, including about 9,500 direct contacts with clients and about 2,000 um, kind of additional contacts involving that were done on, on clients' behalf. So a lot of work was going uh, into this. So again, just to kind of remind you that there was a, about a little bit under 1300 people enrolled. So this is a lot being done on the behalf of every single client. Um, and 47, about half of those were housing related and about a third were related to employment and the remainder were specifically around um, providing support uh, for medical care. So again, just to kind of reiterate that point, um, that's a lot of encounters per participant, about nine per participant. Although there's quite a range of variability in kind of in talking to uh, interventionists at the sites, um, this variability was sort of a real, a real thing that they expressed where some folks had uh, very limited need for contact and follow-up. And then there were some folks who had really intensive needs uh, and needed a, a, to work very intensely with, with interventionists. And you can sort of see the breakdown there. Um, and the average duration per counter, a little under an hour. Um, and these interventionists were, were working very hard. I mean, the average caseload of, of 32 clients um, and, and doing all this, uh, uh, yeah, so um, a lot, uh, just it's important to document this just to kind of demonstrate kind of the effort that uh, goes into actually providing these interventions across all 12 sites in addition to kind of the logging of the outcomes that uh, just summarized. And then these are just kind of some quotes from um, interviews with clients about kind of uh, their participation in the inter, inter um, their participation in the intervention itself. And I think some of this stuff tracks with um, what Eric and, and Sylvia sh shared from their own specific sites, just this client speaking about, um, you know, the inc their increased um, confidence in um, what they're able to do when it comes to, um, you know, not just specifically with respect to their um, HIV care, but just overall. And uh, here's just some uh, specific quote about uh, the support that the SPINS intervention provided to one client around uh, employment and sort of the uh, support. I think this is an interesting quote because it talks both sort of about um, the resources and the connections to potential opportunities that the interventionist provided, sort of the concrete and tangible stuff, but also um, kind of the social aspect of things, the support that the interventionist provided to uh, this client in um, you know, helping them uh, navigate uh, towards employment. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Serena here, who I think is gonna uh, try and sum up some overall lessons that we learned um, as the multi-site evaluation team from having a perspective across all 12 of the sites. Thanks, Tom. 
Yeah, so um, in looking at the overall lessons learned and talking with staff from the across the interventions, as well as uh, a subset of clients, and you heard a little bit already um, from Sylvia and Eric that um, housing and employment stability, it's not linear. Uh, one of the key things we saw, and COVID really disrupted our process, is that you know clients um, were making great progress. They may be getting a temporary job or temporary housing um, within the first few weeks, and then maybe there was some sort of loss for them, or they had a setback or relapse with substance use. So it, it's not that you get to a six month period and then you're done. Um, this is a, a cyclical process, it's progress. We need to um, constantly provide that support and that's what the navigators and care coordinators did. And I think we would also argue, we didn't predict the COVID pandemic, but in general, we saw this. This was, um, the interventions were funded for up to three years, but really you need a longer project cycle for pro stable housing and employment, particularly for this vulnerable population that maybe half didn't have the employment history or they had been you know, relying on benefits and had been out of the workforce. And as Sylvia said, programs like Power um, provide them with that skill, that peer support, so they can get to, um, to stable housing, to stable employment. And as Eric mentioned, we see programs, the temporary hotel stays, the gap lodging are necessary as that first step to get to um, a stable place to live. But it, you know, a month, 30 days might not be enough. You might need for some clients longer than that. Okay, let's see if I can advance. Um, the second um, piece that we heard again from Sylvia for, at a client level, is really giving them training and support around um, how to in understand, particularly if they have any income generation, what's how's that going to impact their, their social security, their housing, their medical benefits, to um, really engage in budget planning. Uh, and Tom showed you some of the data on how intense this is. Uh, there may be people who have been on for a long time, decades, and you can work, but they're not aware of it. They haven't calculated that. And it takes time and give them training and understanding um, that when they do find a job, they know how much money they're earning, how that will impact so that they can live um, more productive lives and stable lives. And so we also um, found in our outcome data, and we also heard from Sylvia, this social support and networks are really critical. Uh, the peer mentorship. Um, many of our navigators were um, peers, um, people living with HIV who at one point had been unstably housed or had been underemployed or unemployed, who can share those experiences. And so that really helps um, with sharing the successes, the motivations and the encouragement. Uh, the other interesting, um, in terms of particularly for employment, uh, we call it promoting an entrepreneurial spirit. Oops, I spelled that wrong. Sorry, folks. Um, but we had a couple of sites where that traditional employment model that Sylvia talked about just didn't work, going to find the wage, um, the, 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 the job with a, a steady wage. We had clients who were, um, you know, recent immigrants whose documentation status was in the process, uh, was undocumented or on the process to being legally documented. We had people coming out of incarceration who had, um, navigators had to work with to um, clear their records or um, so that they could work and get jobs in the formal sector. But what we found is that some of our sites also helped um, people find um, promote their own businesses. There was um, one client, um, a, a mother whose husband passed away from HIV. She learned herself during the course of our program that she was living with HIV and she had to support her children. And so they connected her with resources where she could find loans and she started her own um, sort of catering business. And from there, then she got a food truck. So there's ways of looking outside the box besides that traditional employment sector um, for some clients. And it goes back to what Sylvia said. What is their goal? How much income? What can they do? Do they have to take care of family? How often can they work? When can they work? So it might not be that traditional employment sector. 
Um, Eric and Sylvia already mentioned this, but I just want to highlight it. Having a champion and coordinator is really critical for housing employment. Um, medical case managers, traditional HIV case manager, can't take this on necessarily. Housing and employment are intensive work, and having a program director, supervisor, um, who can help champion the frontline workers, the navigators, the care coordinators, who can build those coalitions across sectors, housing, employment, and healthcare, which traditionally don't work together, um, is really needed. And um, I, Eric and Sylvia can give you more examples of what they did and how they regularly brought people together to talk about and share opportunities across the sectors to make sure that their, um, their clients were getting the needs whether it be housing at that point, whether it be employment, whether it be food, whether it be medical care, and that's what's needed. Um, emphasizing again at an organizational level, having a dedicated staff who can do that coaching empowerment, that peer mentorship, the one that can take time to connect people to job training, to help people navigate online searches. Um, you know, many of us are of a generation where we are learning the, the tech world, right? These LinkedIn, the Facebook, these are all important. Um, Monster.com, uh, where you find jobs now. And for many of um, our clients who are living with HIV, who have been living with HIV or maybe over 50, they want to work, but they might not be so tech savvy. And having a dedicated staff member who can work through that, teach them how to use the computer, how to navigate through these, these uh, online programs, these social media is really important these days. Um, another thing I, we just want to emphasize, we found, and Tom addressed this a little bit with the, the barriers, is that um, there is still stigma and discrimination out there. Um, one third of our participants did report still experiencing fear of um, not wanting to work because fear of having to disclose their state status at the workplace. And so really, um, either because they were living with HIV or because of their um, gender identity, particularly our clients who identified as transgender, um, there's still st stigma and discrimination out there. And we need um, organizations and staff to help clients connect with the legal services so they get the IDs, that they can make changes on their social security cards, that they can get the legal documentation to work. This is all needed um, if we're to improve employment and housing stability for our clients. Um, a couple of things um, in terms of linking with the employment sector, uh, Sylvia talked about this, but our initiative, I wanna just emphasize uh, our initiative, um, it started out by also bringing not only HAPWA to help with housing, but Department of Labor organizations, the employee assistant partnerships in the local area. Um, and for some of the clients, um, this can be challenging, particularly the ones who've been um, chronically homeless for a number of years, who've been out of the workforce. Um, it may be hard to create that motivation for them to enter the work, the workforce out of fear of discrimination. Um, and so really spending time to look at who's the appropriate client to link with the employee assistant programs. We did have um, sites that uh, were very successful in doing this, but it's not a one-stop, um, the box stops there with all the employment programs. You really need, as Sylvia talked about, do an assessment with your client, what are their skills? Will they be able to go into one of these employee assistant programs? What are the skills needed? But coordinators can build that bridge with those agencies and figure out what's the best fit. Maybe they have to enter a job training program first before just accessing the types of jobs that are offered in that um, assistance, those employee assistance programs. Um, Eric talked very nicely about the role, I, I have it here called emergency housing support, but the temporary housing support, uh, temporary hotel stays, the gap lodging. This is really critical. Um, there is opportunity to use Ryan White dollars now for some of these temporary stays. I, I do encourage you to reach out to Sylvia and Eric um, and other sites um, that were part of this initiative, how they set up the um, agreements that um, were needed, the process for getting that um, housing support, how they paid for hotel stays. These are all really critical steps. People don't just go from chronic homelessness immediately into 
um, permanent stable housing and stay there. There are some steps and, and people may just need a temporary place so they can get back on their feet. Um, and then uh, also about the, Eric mentioned this as um, well as Sylvia, they're looking at private landlords and building those relationships with the private sector is really critical. We tend to think um, in our Ryan White services, we go to other government funded agencies like HOPWA, like the Department of Labor Assistant Programs. But there's a whole private sector that is looking for um, that that has housing available, that um, has jobs available. And we heard this from Eric, you know, forming links with uh, privately owned um, hotel chains to help get temporary um, status. We had some um, sites that offered a housing fair and brought real estate agents together along with um, landlords to help match clients. Um, and the SPINS program served as that intermediate intermediate to help negotiate and um, stay and help um, find the appropriate place for their clients, as well as with business owners. Um, a couple of sites, I, I know uh, the site in Chicago, they did a whole what they called um, summit, job summit and brought um, uh, uh, employers together with their clients and um, helped find job opportunities, collecting people, connecting people to job sources. And um, this is really important. And one thing I wanna emphasize on this as well is that if you're working with the private sector, there may be a need to educate around the American disabilities laws and, uh, and making sure the place is the right environment and what sort of accommodations need to be made for people with HIV and create these um, living and uh, work friendly spaces. So um, those, those are some of the lessons learned. And I just want to highlight here resources that you can find those implementation manuals that Eric talked about and Sylvia talked about. They're located here on the Target HIV Center. The, the website is down here. So you can find manuals. You can find a rec, um, sample policies and procedures, screening tools that can help guide your program um, in your local area. I just want to acknowledge our funders at the HIV AIDS Bureau. And again, um, special thanks to the intervention and evaluation staff across the 12 sites and their clients who really um, helped make this initiative um, its success and give us some of the lessons learned for sharing with you all across the Ryan White program. So thank you very much for your attention. Here's our contact information. And um, right now we'll move to a time for some questions and answers. Thank you. Before we begin our question and answer session, we would like to thank our presenters for addressing this timely and interesting topic. Thank you so much. At this time, we will pose questions from attendees that we have been collecting throughout the presentation. Please note that you may still submit questions using the chat feature. I would also like to welcome back the presenters for the question and action question question and answer portion of the session. The first question, well, this isn't a question, it's a comment from Jamie Shank. I would like to vouch for PIHC. Eric and team with helping share their gap lodging program. It was a huge help to our team in Kansas City and through learning from PIHC, we were able to implement the program, house folks and trans transition them to permanent housing, exclamation points. Two, is there something like this in Texas? Some of my clients need this service. 16 weeks will give them a chance to get their footing. Who would like to take that? Well, you know, we had a um, we had a couple of demonstration sites in Texas. I don't think any of them had a program quite like this, um, and it sort of does raise the question. And I think for me, one of the takeaways was kind of um, potentially about the need for more um, or a dedicated federal funding for a program like this. Um, I know there's 
funds that might come from other sources like HUD that you could use to, to do some of this stuff. But it, for me, that was sort of one of the big takeaways is sort of seeing some of the innovative stuff folks were doing around housing and temporary housing in particular at the different sites and just thinking about uh, what a boon it would be to all the sites that we work with if there was sort of a dedicated funding source um, for this specifically. But um, so I, that's sort of an indirect answer to the question, but. Um, I could say um, the hotel chain that we worked with, they, I just looked it up. It looks like they have 31 locations across Texas. Yeah. Not exactly sure where they are, but um, if that person wants to reach out, um, feel free to email me or call me. Um, I'd be willing to kind of share contact info or, you know, specifics like how we, you know, how we arrange things, how we build things, how we paid for things. Um, and there was another question from, I think it's Josh Kratz. <clears throat> Josh was asking kind of the same thing. Would you be willing to share um, about um, a budget or, you know, kind of how you put everything together? So if anyone wants to contact me, please feel free. And uh, like Serena mentioned in the, in her uh, part of the presentation, our manual's online too. So you can probably pick up a lot of info off of that, but I'm more than willing to talk to anyone that wants to talk. I got time. Okay. The intervention manuals are really, really detailed. So you will have, I mean, really step-by-step -step in most of them. So I think it's really to your advantage to grab them. Okay. Josh Kratz also asked, were these housing programs using the housing first approach? Seems like it but I would love to have you elaborate more on this or other approaches you used. It was more or less housing first. Um, I would say, you know, it's, if somebody has insurmountable issues or odds, like sometimes we have to kind of straighten those out before I'm willing to, you know, put them in a hotel room and give them the keys and, you know, Give them their complete freedom and you know all that kind of stuff we do you know we do put stipulations on it like you know if you are in our substance use program you have to continue to come to the program you have to continue to you know to stay clean if you have a mess up we can work around that but you know if someone's like two weeks into sobriety i probably would have put them in a hotel room i'd probably try and find them a different you know um substance based um situation or if someone's having you know mental health breakdown things like that emergencies um, but if you're working with things like domestic violence or, um, you know, folks with children, whether it's mom or dad, um, any kind of trans violence, sex trafficking, stuff like that, you just kind of have to, you know, use your intuition. That's why I highly suggest having, you know, social workers kind of work on this program because they can, you know, they can get to the, uh, you know, the crux of the issue. Like, why are you on the street? You know, is it, mm -hmm. you know, how are you surviving? You know, are, if you're, you know, engaging in sex work, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But at the same time, I might not be able to put you in a hotel <laughs> because, you know, we, you know, we also have relationships with the, uh, the folks that run the place and we want to be good stewards of the money and good, you know, good neighbors as well, because there's also, it's a hotel. A lot of people live there. Um, so having, you know, those pre-screens and acuity scales for um, case managers and all that stuff's in the manual too. Um, but again, I'm willing to talk to anyone that wants to talk over the phone or Zoom or whatever. Okay. Thinking about your program participants, what was the breakdown of the identities and demographics? What were your successes and challenging challenges in reaching the people most in need? What issues, if any, did you have with hotels or other housing partners when it came to working with clients? Were there challenges around discrimination or stigma? Serena uh, responded by saying, hi, Josh, great questions. Hopefully we will be answering some of your questions during the presentation, but definitely we can elaborate in discussion. And then we had not a question, but a comment from Jonathan Kimbo. Part of my organization's individualized service plan included initial identification of the individual's strength. Response from Serena. Love that idea, Jonathan. 
Question about the link being shared in chat. Response. Link is shared by Sylvia, and she also said she will send the Excel document to anyone who emails her at smoscarelio at libertycs.org. It's in the chat. Kimberly, I can say um, part of our demographics, um, we found <clears throat> after going through this for three years that we were drastically underserving women so the next SPINS project that we took on was actually focused specifically on black um, cis and trans women. So that's, you know, like a lesson learned from that. Like we were like, oh, wow. Like we only out of, I think the hundred people we served, I think we only maybe have like 12 women. And that just really seemed dispropor disproportionate to, mm. you know, the client makeup that we have at our agency and the people that actually need the help. Um, but it was a pretty even breakdown between um, black, white, Hispanic, just because Atlanta is pretty diverse. I know some of the other locations, you know, they're in Texas, or, you know, there were certain areas of the country where you're going to get different demographics. Um, but that was the big standout for us. And the other big one was almost, I would say, uh, I can't ex remember the exact number, but probably about 80% of our uh, participants were either in um, mental health care or in substance use care or both. So, mm. you know, reasons for you know, things that lead to homelessness are often, you know, exacerbated by those two things. So if you can get folks stable, you can get them not only into um, their health care, the HIV care, but then you've also got their, you know, you have, you have their attention and it's a lot easier to get them to come to behavioral health care, substance use, and it just kind of opens up the world for, for our clients to engage in everything. Can, can I jump in here too for a second? Um, to answer that question and build on what Eric's saying, I think, you know, one of the the really key factors that this initiative was able to do was not just working with individuals, but working at a system level. And I think Sylvia and Eric, maybe you want to talk about this a little bit more. And it's it's really important. You all brought together on a regular basis um, on monthly or bi-monthly community meetings, I'll call them, or sister level meetings where the housing coordinators in your area were there, where the, there were employers, where there were healthcare people. And I think it helped in terms of uh, reducing the barriers at the system level, particularly for vulnerable populations, like um, people who identify as transgender. I mean, there's stigma and discrimination in how, finding housing for them, finding employment, just getting the IDs. And meeting regularly with the various providers across the sectors, um, it's intensive, it, but it needs to be done. And I don't think just case managers themselves can do all that work. You, you guys have, you all who are on this call know, you, you have like caseloads of 200 people dealing with immediate needs. But if there's some sort of regular communication and coordination happening at leadership levels, that, that make sure we know which clients need what, when we need to do this, get this person, this housing, get them ready, it brings on those barriers and reduces that stigma. Um, I don't know, Sylvia, Eric, if you wanna comment more about- I, You know, I'd like, to, I'd like to draw attention to um, our um, intervention manuals. And I know that it was very interesting when we got together from the different sites, how many of us looked at our communities and said, how do we break barriers between housing, health, employment, HIV, and how do we get folks on the same page? And in our intervention manual, we talk about that other, we did two interventions, was a one was a community intervention and one was power on the client level around employment. And the community intervention was called health, housing and employment slash income, which continues to share information right now. And we're going to get back in person, but we we have about 203 members. Mm -hmm. I just know the number is 203 today. Mm -hmm. And um, we um, share information that doesn't typically get to the folks who are where the rubber meets the road. Oftentimes information is disseminated to CEOs or senior program folks. It doesn't get down to the folks who are working with clients. So our group is like more the program manager, hands-on staff. And because I've been in the field for 40 something years, 
I get all sorts of emails with a lot of information. And um, I just pass that on. We do um, hope to get back together post, post most acute part of COVID and um, bring our stakeholders meetings back together, which were great. We had a panel sharing information so that people made contacts. And then we also had like a 20 minute training on a subject that is important to everybody like, um, like um, prevention, some kind of prevention or nurse diversion or some other kinds of services. And then we would have networking, networking, networking. We, don't, we do see that there are more outcomes like housing outcomes for the non-typical housing providers, et cetera. So I know our time is probably up. I see we're at 1241. But anyway, that please look at the intervention manuals and I think you'll see a lot of this work. Were the majority of these individuals employed outside of the HIV arena slash world? Sylvia, you responded, but did, did you want to elaborate on that? No, we were not. We were not placing people in um, in HIV related um, uh, positions. We were placing people in jobs where they had an interest, and so that would take them anywhere. Okay, but not working for ASO, etc. No. Somebody uh, is helping jobs and stuff. <laughs> Not a question from Briggy James. I hope I pronounced that right. Hi, Eric. I am with Emory Midtown RW program and would like to connect with you about your housing assessment tool and the hotel chain PP work with. Sure, I wrote down his name in Emory Midtown. Um, so. I think it's Brad G. If you want to email me, it's in the chat or um, yeah, just send me an email. And okay. I live right down the street from memory, so I can even come to you if you want. And I apologize, everyone. I'm just realizing I'm wearing the exact same shirt that I wore the day we filmed this, which was like a month ago. And I just want y'all to know I do own more than one shirt. Um, <laughs> but I did realize that this morning on the way to work, I'm like, oh, I think I just, I think I messed that one up. But it's been great talking to everyone. <clears throat> Someone commented that the slide is too small to read and asked if the speaker, maybe Thomas, could identify the top three barriers to work. I think Serena may have done that for she me did. in the in the chat, actually. Um, so so I, I think it's back up there and um, yeah, so I won't, I won't go through them now, but um, we should, I don't know, you know, we have an overall final, um, we have an overall manual for all of the 12 demonstration sites that I don't think has been posted yet on the website that I shared the link for, but should be at some point. I think it's just kind of going under review at HRSA right now, but um, it would, a lot of kind of the overall, questions that are not specific to one particular site would be, you know, discussed in, in that document. So it's kind of a parallel document to the site manuals. There's kind of an overall one as well. Okay. How did you cover needs and the services Ryan White cannot reimburse? Our, our agency also has a um, pharmacy component tied to it. So we get a lot of 340B money. Um, but like I said in the presentation, like leveraging all your different resources, so leveraging HOPWA, because HOPWA can take care of certain things, a program like this spins, you can pay for different things that you can't pay for if you're doing, you know, Ryan White, A, B, or C, things like that, because um, this is technically part F, so there's different allowable expenses, um, you know, combining with other agencies around you know, your municipality, wherever you are, you have to be creative, but you know, there's, there's ways to do it. There's ESG grants, there's all kinds of um, homeless grants or, you know, um, shelter grants, things like that. You just really kind of have to dig into it and 
Um, never hurts to have someone on your staff that is well versed in housing, housing policy, HOPWA, et cetera. Even if you are an HIV clinic or an ASO, again, housing is healthcare. If you don't have, you know, someone that knows housing, you're kind of you might be underselling, you know, the good y'all can do. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, everyone, for your participation today. As part of the HIV and AIDS Bureau's efforts to provide you with timely topics and interesting speakers, we appreciate you filling out the session evaluations at the end of each session. If you are seeking continuing education credits, please complete the additional evaluation for credit. To access these evaluations, please return to the session page within the platform and click on the blue evaluation links. Thank you again for joining. If the speakers would, uh, wouldn't mind putting the information in the chat box for everyone to contact you for the questions that we didn't get to, that would be greatly appreciated. Again, thank you everyone for joining.